Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kim Robinson. I am from the Pennsylvania Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, I am also joined by uh, my specialist, Beth Ann Fanning. Um, she is a, the Western Region Transition Specialist. Um, and this, uh, <laughs> this presentation is uh, a set, the second half of OBR Transition Services. Um, in this training, we're going to cover Section 511, Supported Employment and Post-Secondary Services. Um, so, like I said, this is part two. Um, in the first section, we really focused on pre-employment transition services. Um, we did talk a little bit about order of selection previously. Uh, in this training, we're actually going to focus on uh, vocational rehabilitation services. So these, uh, these are services that are typically more for adults, um, and these are services that would most likely be applicable to uh, the order of selection. Uh, OBR's mission is to assist Pennsylvanians with disabilities to secure and maintain employment and independence. Um, we want to give everybody just a little bit of background on OBR um, before we were, uh, get into the meat of our presentation. Uh, just to give you just a general overview of our services, um, we do include services such as the Early, Early Reach Initiative, Free Employment Transition Services, Diagnostic Services, Vocational uh, Evaluations, Counseling and Guidance. Um, those are all uh, typical services that you will hear us speak about within OVR. We also have a sister agency uh, within OVR to, you probably have heard us speak a lot about BVRS, the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation Services. Um, there's also a second bureau, Blur, the Bureau of uh, Blind and Vision Services, uh, and they offer some additional services, and that's on this, uh, also on this PowerPoint slide. Um, they have a specialized children's services. They have the Randolph Shepard Business Enterprise Program, um, and they offer some various uh, instructional and training services um, within the Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services. Um, so just to give you a, a little bit of a breakdown of our agency as a whole. Of course, we are a state agency, so we fall within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, we are part of the Department of Labor and Industry. And then, um, like I said, you probably most likely have heard us speak a lot about the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation Services, but in fact, there are four bureaus within OVR. Um, we, of course, have BBRS. We have the Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services. Uh, we have the Hiram G. Andrews Center, um, and we also have our Bureau of Central Operations. Uh, we actually represent the Bureau of Central Operations, uh, the transition specialist and myself. Oh, I skipped a slide, I'm sorry. Skipped two slides, I think. No. So within each district office, um, there is a makeup of a district administrator and there's an assistant district administrator. Um, each office does employ clerical support staff as well as supervisors. Within BVRS, um, there, of course, are vocational rehabilitation counselors. We also have business service representatives um, and early reach coordinators. Within BVS, um, there are as VR counselors as well. Um, and then within BBVS, there are vocational rehabilitation therapists, orientation and mobility specialists, and social workers. Um, just to give you an idea of where our offices are located throughout the state, um, we do have 15 district offices uh, that represent BBRS, and we have six BBVS offices. Uh, those BBVS offices are, in fact, co-located within, uh, within the same location as BB the BBRS offices, as well as our Higher MG Andrew Center um, our, and our Bureau of Central Operations. Um, so you'll hear us speak about um, being specialists with it that cover certain regions. So just if you're interested in what regions uh, the various specialists cover, um, we do have the western, the central, and the eastern region. Uh, like I said, my name is Kim Robinson. Uh, this is my email address, and Beth Ann Fanning is also joining me. Her email address is up here as well if you would like to get in touch with us. Um, our presentation is going to focus on statewide procedures. Um, some of our other presentations, uh, they, they would have mentioned that they were talking about local programs or statewide programs. Um, we want you to be aware that as we talk, 
uh, these are services and programs that would be available across the state. So we're going to talk about Section 511 first um, of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. So um, one of the defining factors to remember when we talk about Section 511 is it's very important um, to know if the individual is considering work in a subminimum wage environment. So subminimum wage typically refers to a sheltered workshop, um, a pre-vocational services. Uh, you've heard people say pre-voc. Um, it also could possibly include things like service contracts, such as Ability One. Um, it's any of those services where the person is being paid um, below minimum wage. So it's a very important distinction to remember. Um, some minimum wage is really the defining factor in whether or not a person is, is um, going to be expected to apply for VR services. Being an employment first state, um, we are obviously trying to emphasize employment, employment, employment. Um, and when we say employment, we're talking about uh, at least minimum wage employment. So that subliminal wage really is, a, like I said, it's that defining factor in a lot of the decisions about whether or not an individual should be referred to OVR. Um, so specifically, um, Section 511 requires that OVR, state and local education agencies, and the state and local agencies, um, work to satisfy, must satisfy, must ensure that individuals with disabilities, especially youth with disabilities, remember that. It's also, youth, age is also a very important and determining factor when we talk about subminimum, subminimum wage in Section 511. Um, we're expected, they're expected to have meaningful opportunities to prepare for, obtain, maintain, advance in, or regain competitive integrated employment. And that can include supported or customized employment. So when we talk about Section 511 for youth, um, there are three specific requirements that um, must be met before an individual can, uh, excuse me, a youth can enter some minimum wage. They must receive either transition services through their school district through IDEA or pre-employment transition services from OVR. Um, they must apply for services and they must have uh, either been found ineligible or closed unsuccessful, and they must receive career counseling services. So OVR is expected to document all of these things before an individual can enter some minimum wage. When I say individual, excuse me, a youth. Adults have different requirements to enter some minimum wage. Um, once an individual is, are, is within a program that, prior, that pays the minimum wage, um, there are still requirements that they have to fulfill. Uh, there are three, trans, three, excuse me, two specialists within OVR that, um, that provide career information sessions to all persons in Pennsylvania um, that are employed below, below that minimum wage, and it has to be done at least once a year. Um, again, employment first, we're really working to promote competitive integrated employment and inform individuals about the different services that they could potentially receive through OVR. So what's the point of all of this? What are we trying to accomplish with Section 511? Why are we devoting these resources? So by having youth apply for OVR services and receive that career counseling, we're hoping that youth are having the opportunity to explore employment prior to being exposed to that subminimum wage environment or a sheltered employment. Um, we're working to promote competitive integrated employment as the most important, or excuse me, as the first choice. Um, and we're trying to stem that flow of students that are going from directly from high school to a sheltered employment. Um, and of course, we're reminding them that they have choices. Um, typically, Section 511 impacts uh, individuals that have the most significant disabilities. Um, it, it typically impacts individuals that have uh, intellectual disabilities or autism <coughs> most frequently. Um, you may also uh, hear about these individuals. They, they may be individuals that are receiving waiver services. Um, 
know, they may be saying things like, I want to make more money. Those are, when you're hearing things like that, those are typically, um, those are things that we're looking for that those individuals might be interested in doing, doing something else uh, that pays minimum wage. So we're going to get into, the, into a little more of the details um, about some of the different services that have taken effect under WIOA. Um, we did a presentation earlier today about discovering customized employment. Um, we also have revamped our supported employment policy. Um, and we're also collaborating extensively with our Office of Developmental Programs. Um, and I will mention that there are a couple of webinars planned. Um, they, the information should be in your packets about the webinars, but um, it, I believe it was also sent out on the ODP listserv. We are doing a, a webinar with the Office of Developmental Programs um, for the general public. We're also offering a second one for professionals. And then there's also an order of selection a webinar that would be uh, open to the general public and that um, that is on July the 31st so it's July 25th July 30th and July 31st uh, if you want to know inf more information about order of selection and, and how that specifically rate relates to um, our collaboration with the Office of Developmental Programs um, there was an addendum that was uh, that was sent out uh, to the original joint bulletin that was released in the winter. There, there was an addendum that was just signed and released uh, about two weeks ago, and that will be covered within those webinars. <clears throat> um, we talked about this. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, on order selection and how it could impact some minimum wage. Um, so nothing really changes regarding Section 511 under the closure of order selection. So we have to continue to provide the career counseling sessions for individuals that are receiving some minimum wage. We're still going to encourage those individuals to apply. Um, youth with disabilities still must apply and had an eligibility determination prior to uh, entering a subminimum wage environment. Um, the orders, the webinar that is on uh, those webinars will talk about the bullet, the addendum to the bulletin in more detail um, and uh, how adults and students can access, can continue to access services within the order selection. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bethany to talk about supported employment. Hi. How many of you are supported employment providers for OVR? I'm just curious if we have. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so one of the last slides, uh, the next last slide with the 511 asked the question of how OVR was going to serve um, individuals <clears throat> uh, who might be interested in employment. Um, instead of subminimum wage. And so part of what OVR did recently was expanded our supported employment services. A year ago, July 1st, we rolled out a new supported employment policy and procedure, uh, and we added, added some services to that. Now under our umbrella policy, we have community-based work assessment non-performance-based supported employment, performance-based supported employment, and discovery and customized employment. Some key components to OVR's supported employment um, is that they are services individualized to those with the most significant disabilities who require intensive one-on-one -on -one supports or on-site supports. Um, there's a focus on competitive integrated employment, so that's employment that's at sub or at minimum wage or better, and integrated uh, in that an individual gets to work with um, coworkers who may have disabilities, but also coworkers without disabilities. Um, and then there's a focus on intensive and ongoing supports. So two of our services that 
uh, can be utilized to start the process with supported employment. Our community-based work assessment, this was a service that we had prior to the new policy and we continue to have. Um, <laughs> I was taught in elementary school not to, not to use a definition that includes words and the, yeah, and this one does. But anyway, community-based work assessment is an assessment conducted in a community setting. Um, and the purpose of it is to help a customer learn about his or her abilities, but also uh, to determine if competitive integrated employment is an appropriate vocational goal. We also have a service called the SE Support Plan, and that's where um, the provider, that this covers the intake that our providers do with our customers, as well as having them look at all the information that's already available about that individual, perhaps evaluations or assessments that have been done. Uh, and that, that information helps determine what direction we go with supported employment services, or even if we do support employment at all. Some new services that we added, so we've only had these for a year now. They're called non-performance based, um, but that is just to contrast it with our performance based supported employment, which um, where we're looking at certain milestones to, um, in, a, in, in payment points. Um, so these tend to be either um, more sporadic or off-site. For example, job mentoring. This is for customers who may not need coaching to learn the job skills or to perform the job skills, but they need a lot of support um, off-site just to get there and um, do what they need to do to um, to prepare to apply for a job, um, and, and to adjust initially, but they don't need the coach necessarily with them on site. Another service is job retention, and this is for our customers who are currently working and um, need some support to maybe relearn job tasks, uh, or maybe there's been a change in supervision and they have to adjust to a new supervisor, so they just need a little bit of support to deal with job changes. This is a service where, not exclusively, but um, we would use this if someone already had our performance-based support employment and just needed a little help to adjust to something new. Intermittent supported employment services. Um, this is short-term sporadic assistance, and this is used more in cases where Maybe we didn't go down the road of supported employment. We're providing other VR services. The person gets a job, but we realize they need some coaching just, just to, um, to, to keep from losing a job, basically. Performance-based supported employment is um, a phased, it's done in phases. There's job development, which are all the activities that prepare our customer and the employer and the em employment site uh, to be ready for that customer to start a job. The job placement is the first 40 hours of an individual's employment and the coaching that's provided during that time. And then job maintenance, job stabilization, and case closure, we have those um, lumped together because the, those three phases are negotiated, the hours for those are negotiated by the individual's needs. Um, previously, uh, supported employment uh, was paid out at certain, um, when certain dates were um, reached, like five days on the job, 45 days on the job, 90 days on the job, and if somebody was working at 90 days, the case was closed. Now the focus is on job stabilization. So the progress that someone makes through these phases is geared more towards um, how they're doing on the job, 
and the amount of coaching that they need at, at different points. OVR now has discovering customized employment. We had it as a pilot and it was rolled out in phases. Now it falls under our supported employment policy. And this is for our customers who uh, maybe, maybe in the past we didn't even consider that our services um, could help them get to competitive integrated employment or they tried supported employment in the past and we're not successful. Okay. So with discovery and customized, uh, there's four phases initially, the discovery process, the discovery profile, the customized employment plan meeting, the customized employment meeting and the plan that's developed from it, and um, the visual resume. And those are um, distinct services that are paid at a flat rate. And then the um, job development, placement, maintenance, stabilization, closure, that follows similar to our performance-based. Um, so it, it goes in phases and, um, and, and kind of follows that model. Another thing that we have is extended services. So it may be that someone um, has reached the maximum level of stability that that individual is able to do, and, but, and they're still employed, but they need supports to stay employed. So those, it can go into extended services. OVR can pay for that if there is no alternative funding source. So um, supported employment in regards to um, students with disabilities, uh, these services would come into play closer to when the student is transitioning, um, getting close to graduation, and they would be transitioning out of high school in, into regular permanent employment. <clears throat> Should I take questions on supported employment or just keep moving along? Did you? I'm sorry. If a, yeah, um, she's asking if a student can access supported employment in the closed order of selection. Um, if a student is nearing graduation and um, they don't already have a case with us where they have an individualized plan for employment, um, they would apply for services, go through the eligibility process, which, for example, um, community-based work assessment or discovery could be um, rendered because that's an assessment, right? Um, but then once they're determined eligible, they would go on the waiting list. So. Um, yeah, so the, the supported employment is affected by the closed order of selection. Here, she's gonna let you say this into a microphone. Sorry, just to verify timing on that, um, in recent history, I was told two years before the end of graduation, before graduation, is that still what OVR is saying? With opening a case opening with OVR? A, trying to open a case with OVR. Um, so that's a little bigger than just supported employment. Do you want, do you want to? Could you? Yeah, you can go ahead. And. I think if you're going to wait in line, it might be a good idea. Just thought. Um, so I would say a good milestone would be two years prior to graduation. Um, but uh, it is also recommended under WIOA that a student should apply for services whenever it's deemed appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. from some of the PETS services if they're determined eligible, is that correct? Only if they are determined eligible prior right. to receiving one of the five required PETS. So, so it's a little strategic, right? It's a little strategic, yes. Right. Yeah. It, it's still very important to apply for services and, and um, to be placed on that waiting list, yes. Um, but 
um, as long as they received one of those re five required PETS prior to being placed on the order selection uh, waiting list, then they can continue to receive PETS. It is a little tricky. Yeah, it, there, there's definitely some str some strategy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not, I I want to be clear. I'm not saying wait to apply. No, no, I'm just saying so, just don't get so you can go yeah. pre-employment transition services, open a case, continue to receive pre-employment transition services. So, correct. But if you do, if you do open case, then you can't receive pre-employment transition service because you're considered sort of an adult in the system. No. no? Um, well, you ha you have if you're placed on the waiting list. In order to open it before you turn 18 or graduate. Not, not in order to open a case. I, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm trying to get clarity here, and I'm somebody who th I think I know a little bit, but I don't. I'm getting comp I'm getting confused. So if you could clarify. <laughs> what was that about? You have to get a PETS service. Yeah, Denise. Oh, Denise sorry. is our in-house guru <laughs> on order <of> selection. <laughs> Thanks, Shannon. So the key is whether you've received a pre-employment transition service first or not. So if you've received a pre-employment transition service at any point, then you apply for OVR services, you can continue to receive the pre-employment transition service throughout, throughout your application, throughout your eligibility decision, and throughout waiting on the waiting list. If you've received that pre-employment transition service, before you've applied, or even when you apply, like as you're an applicant, you could receive a pre-employment transition service. The key is it just has to have been provided by the time the eligibility decision and order of selection decision is made. So, or you can be a student who has never applied and continue to receive pre-employment transition services. I mean, they will just if you haven't applied, you just continue to receive pre-employment transition services. As long as you never apply, then, then that's the second path. And the third path, the only path that gets tricky, is if a student has never received a pre-employment transition service, then applies and gets placed on a closed order, then they can't get services or pre-employment transition services. So there's actually three different paths and the last path is the tricky path where if you've never received a pre-employment transition service and then you get put on the wait list, then you can't receive it. You always want the student to have a pre-employment transition service, which really follows our model. I mean, because a pre-employment transition service is supposed to be your first exposure. That's your first entry into, you know, exploration of work and OVR services and that kind of thing. So as long as that's provided, that early exposure in that pre-employment transition services, and then you apply, then there's no problem with you being on the waiting list in terms of pre-employment transition services. Of course, there's still a problem because you can't receive any individualized plan services, but you can continue to receive pre-employment transition services. Okay. Yes. You have to repeat her question. If oh, she's not so she said, the mic, you have to she said work-based learning is considered an individualized service service. I mean, in general, work-based learning experiences are individualized services. Um, we have been doing them via an open case up to this point. So I would say stay tuned. We're still fine-tuning some of what's to come. Um, in October 1st when we roll out a new PETS model. So you'll hear more of that by starting by the end of the month. Thank you. Sorry, I have a question. Um, this is probably a not likely scenario, but would come up. If someone is on that tricky path and then um, their um, education partner enrolls them in PETS group service, 
um, unbeknownst to the provider of that service. And then, you know, we don't bill until the end of it. Was there any thought of like how that might go if they're technically not eligible for PTS services, but then receive a group service? Those, those are questions and guidance that we're working on. Because, yeah, we have, we have. Right. It it just, it's definitely something it kind of that, cross that's come across our, uh, yeah. come to our attention and we're working on guidance towards that end. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I can finish. You want to finish? Um, yeah, so there's a little bit more to it and then we'll open back up. Um, I just wanted to, um, well, I wanted to say one thing. Well, I just wanted to assure you that the federal government was the one that came up with all those little paths. We, we didn't think that up because that, it's a little bit ridiculous. But, um, and the other thing I would say, you made a little bit of a comment about if someone starts the application process, can they say, hold on my eligibility? Um, there are certain time frames that kick in when someone applies for services, so we have, we are also bound by dates with that too, so, yeah. Our experience has been that the person had to be open to get the individual service, but that's not necessarily the case. So it would allow you still to access. That's the part we're still working on, figuring out. Yeah. Okay. Basically. I did have a 511 question, though. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm going to get this right. Help me. Okay. So if a, a person is in a workshop and they um, mm -hmm. want to go to work, and they can buy, they're going to bypass VR because they have a waiver and, um, and they bypass because of the closed order selection. Mm -hmm. But you have a responsibility as OVR to track that, correct? Because you have to track where people say, I want to go to work or whatever. Isn't there a tracking? Um, under Section 511. Under Section 511? Yeah. Um, under Section 511, we're required to track um, our career counseling sessions with individuals within that are, that are currently in sub-minimum wage environments. Um, and then we are required to track youth. Um, now, a youth would still have to apply for VR services. Um, they can't bypass if they have a waiver? They can't completely bypass it. We're going to go into more detail about that um, with, okay. the, with the webinar on the addendum to the bulletin. Um, but they still, they'll still have to apply for OBR services. But do you still then have the ability to track? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Even if they are not using your service then? Or do they? Well, if they're an adult, they can, they can, the addendum to the bulletin allows them to uh, access ODP services without opening a VR case. Right. So they would access ODP. How do you track that though? Because you're on the other well, side. Well, for the adult side, we're not required to track adults. We're required to track uh, to track the youth, and we're required to track um, individuals that are in subminimum wage. But if it's a 23 or 24 right. year old, like mm -hmm. so, adult, in, so you're track calling youth under 25. 24. 20. Well, yeah, under 25. Under 25. Yeah, 24 and younger. Right, so, so that person could likely have a waiver though, right? Right. So they're in ODP receiving the service. How are you tracking back? Because you have to track, you're telling me. So they're in yeah, sheltered yeah. work. Yeah. We, so we, they're in sheltered work. Mm -hmm. You do the career counseling at the subminimum wage location. Mm -hmm. And they want to go to work. Yes. And you need to track that, but because of your new agreement, they can go straight to waiver. Is that correct? Yes. Am I saying that correct, Denise? I'm they don't necessarily use OVR, though. If they are in a sheltered workshop, they're going to have supported employment. It would be OVP-supported employment. Right, but, these but only because of the new agreement, but OVR has a responsibility to track the success of their career counseling for individuals in subminimum wage under Section 511. We, yeah, we, we, we do keep track of all the individuals in the workshop. We do maintain databases all, of all of them in our career counseling they're sessions. The but they're not out of the We still, if they've been in the workshop, we have them in our database, and we track that information. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. It's that cross, cross system thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, there we are doing a webinar specific to to that addendum. It, uh, it's going to go into a lot more detail about that specific that specific uh, student population, youth population. Okay. Post-secondary education services. And you can go ahead. Um, it is OVR's policy to provide for the reasonable financial support of customers in their attendance at college and universities. Costs allowable for consideration of support include tuition, fees, books, supplies, room and board, and transportation. Types of training that OVR uh, may be able to assist with our college and university training, business trade or technical schools, and non-traditional training. And there's examples of all of those there. And you can go ahead. Um, and then uh, CTPs, which are comprehensive transition programs. These are degree certificate or non-degree programs for students with intellectual disabilities. Um, they are offered by, uh, they can be offered by a college or a career school. They have to be approved by the U.S. Department of Education, and there is um, a website where you can go to see what programs across the country are approved by the Department of Ed. Um, they are designed to support students with intellectual disabilities who want to continue academic career and independent living instruction to prepare for gainful employment. Um, these programs offer academic advising and structured curriculum. Um, they uh, require a student with an intellectual ability um, to um, participate at least half of their time in regular enrollment in credit bearing and non with credit bearing courses with non-disabled students. They can audit or participate. Um, in courses for which the student does not receive regular academic credit. There's enrollment in non-credit bearing, non-degree courses with non-disabled students or internships or, or work-based training with non-disabled individuals. So we are able to look at helping with funding for those as well. So I, I have a question about the um, impact on OVR for college funding. Um, is it based on the student who turns 18 or the adult who turns 18's income? Or is it like real life where family income factors into education? I, I, I just find that very challenging uh, just from an economic perspective to think about how those dollars are being used and there might be families who have the resources, and like their other typical kids, they would anticipate that they have to pay for college mm -hmm. or take loans. Caitlin, did you want to go ahead? I Since say, that's your specialty area. <laughs> mm. um, so typically when we look at, we have a max amount that we can fund per semester for a student that is attending training if it's something that is agreed upon and placed on their plan for employment. Um, and so when we look to do that calculation, we are typically looking at the FAFSA um, information, and that's typically filled out using the parent's income. Um, if for some reason the um, parent's income is very high um, and it's impacted the amount, we haven't maybe reached the maximum amount, um, you can always talk to your counselor about what other circumstances we should consider and take into account and do waivers. There's always that option, so definitely talk to your counselors about what's going on if we don't hit that maximum. So. Okay. The other questions about any of the topics that we covered? Mm -hmm. Is everybody tired because it's the end of the day? <laughs> <laughs> and some of us traveled in this morning. <laughs> How long do you anticipate this order, knowing what you know about sort of the general like wait time for services and things, do you have any anticipated idea of the amount of time people are going to be waiting for services? 
we we don't have an anticipated amount. I, I sure wish we did. Um, what we know is that our staff, we asked our staff to really try to get people who they could get into a planned status and they really came through. And we put uh, 6,000 people into a planned status in the quarter where we usually put 3,000 people into a planned status. So what we know is that we're faced right away with double the amount of people who we have to serve than we would normally serve in a quarter. So that's probably gonna delay us opening um, the order of selection by a bit. But there are too many factors for us to even estimate at this point. I mean, we sure are hopeful that we're gonna receive some reallocation dollars from the Rehabilitation Services Administration when they give those out in August. Um, we're also really hopeful about various forms of legislation that are pending that would bring more uh, vocational rehabilitation monies into programs like ours nationally. I mean, we know that it's a national issue. We know that other states are also looking at closed orders of selection. Um, so we're really hopeful that some of those efforts will result in additional funds being allocated to the VR program, not just in Pennsylvania, but nationally. So lots of factors. It's really hard to tell. So, so just two more things then. And, um, concern about people who are currently in jobs and retention and concern about people who know they have a job. Like I have somebody who's going to hire me right now and I need the support. What's going to happen with that? So we understand that there are definitely people who uh, will have a difficult time during this order selection. We did not take it lightly. Please know that we recognized in OVR that we really had no other choice but to close the order of selection. So we know that there's going to be some tough challenges. Um, right now in Pennsylvania, uh, OVR has not chosen to prioritize job retention. Let me just briefly discuss that. Uh, so four years ago when we developed our state plan in Pennsylvania as a result of WIOA, we chose not to prioritize job retention, um, and this gets a little bit in the weeds and I'm sorry, but because it would go outside of the order of selection and anybody who needed job retention services would be able to receive them. So four years ago, we made that decision. Now we are looking at a plan update that needs to go into effect for July 1st, 2020, and whether we'll make that same decision or not remains um, a question. We haven't started talking about that new state plan, yet we will be doing public meetings for that in the fall of 2019. So if you have an opinion on that, we would certainly welcome that to happen during those public meetings. Did I get it? Anything else? You know I have more, but I'm gonna keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I have another question. If somebody, so um, getting a community-based work assessment is, could be, um, so that's a service somebody could get before getting supported employment, like going down the, down the further road mm -hmm. for eligibility, right? So, but to some degree, isn't that, I don't mean this in any kind of like whatever way, but a little bit of a, so you could be putting out money for community-based work assessments and the person can't move forward because we know that, right? So you're putting money into something that can't go forward for an indefinite period of time. Now they could pick up under waiver potentially, but not everybody has a waiver. So isn't that an area that you could just say, we're not doing this for anybody who, unless they're in that plan status because it doesn't make sense or am I misspeaking like is that a am I understanding that right <laughs> okay <laughs> it <clears throat> so it depends what it's for um, if we need to do the community-based work assessment to determine eligibility then we're required to do it because we have to we are still required to determine eligibility we are still required to place people on the order of selection so if that's the mechanism that we need to use to determine if somebody's eligible then we're required to do it um, if it's just a matter of getting somebody 
um, a CBWA to determine like job goals, what their interests are, that kinds of thing, then it might not be as uh, it might not be as good an idea to do it, and we would probably uh, not do it in those situations. But if it's, if it's to determine eligibility, we would do it. So when we get referrals for those, we don't actually know what that road is that that person's on, right? I mean, we assume, I mean, we write them with the assumption, we, we do them with the assumption that it's to plan for services moving forward and what they might like and, you know, what's a good match, et cetera. But, uh -huh. But we don't really know, does this mean the person's going to stop, or is this person now in, potentially could receive the service? So it's a little tricky, mm -hmm. right? I mean. <clears throat> yeah, this, I mean. It's a little. It's all, the whole thing is a little tricky. We yeah. Absolutely get it. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I wasn't missing the mark. Yeah. And, say, and I would have that conversation, too, with the, with the counselor and the customer as far as where they are at in this process and kind of what the outcome is going to be. So that way you guys know, too, when you're well, was, writing recommendations and a plan. Ask us, so what's the next step? So mm -hmm. normally mm -hmm. I would say, well, the next step is, oh, well, but mm -hmm. I can't really assume that anymore. I can't really assume next step. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I would add to that though I would say that I mean you're you still need to do that assessment as you would normally and come to those conclusions because um, once that per, even if they end up on a waiting list when they come off of it you want that information to proceed in the direction so I to me, I don't think that the fact that they might end up on a waiting list should change how you conduct that assessment or the, or the conclusions that you come to necessarily. The only thing I would say is that, that it does still reflect a point in time, though. So if it's a year later or two years later, to be honest, you have to do something else to kind mm -hmm. of bring it up to speed. You know, somebody could have new child care issues. They could have, I mean, people's lives change all the time. All mm -hmm. our lives change. Mm -hmm. So it, if, it's, if it's years, which it could be, logically, then you really are only, you are, because you are only assessing a point in time. So it wouldn't necessarily be highly relevant by the time you get there. It, it, but it does give you information for that moment. That yeah. would be my only. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know before there was discussion about having more of a data sharing agreement between ODP and OVR. Have, have we gotten anywhere with that? Or cause I think that is still a barrier to knowing who has what and where their documentation lies. We do have a current data sharing agreement between us and, o and ODP. Yeah. Um, so like a supports coordinator could know if someone has an OVR determination? We are working towards uh, towards ease of access yeah. uh, within the, within our co the Commonwealth uh, Development System. I apologize. I, I told the other group this. I am just coming off of maternity leave, so I'm still getting updated on some things. Um, I know that that is in development. The the talking of the systems, but I, I'm not sure where our status is on that. Yeah, I think that's going to be huge moving yeah, I forward. I agree with you absolutely. And I just have one other comment. Um, you know, I was just looking over the bulletin again, and you know, it talks about um, if someone gets um, a case closure before lack of contact, then they have to reapply and go back on the wait list. Mm -hmm. One thing that we've experienced is that um, you know sometimes people aren't the best with their phones or reading their mail or things like that, and through not their own desire, they're getting you know letters that we're going to close for lack of contact. So we try to help them to really rush and get. Mm -hmm. um, get back with their counselor. But I just feel like that might be a point to kind of maybe look at um, what are the parameters for contact because if it's now even more impactful, like if you get on, get kind of closed and you have to go back on the waitlist, that could be a year or two years. So it's going to be a bigger impact. So maybe a little more thought on the contact side. I appreciate the, the feedback. Is there anything else? <laughs> How is your current staffing at OVR? Like, cause that, that maybe, I mean, it's easy. <laughs> no, it's just a, like, is, has it gotten, have you been able to fill those positions? And yeah, the complement of staff. 
Thank you for attending our sessions, Denise. Denise, did you want to come? <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm the director of BVRS. I'll let Shannon add anything that she would want for the um, um, for BBVS and HGAC and central office, because as you know, we have four different bureaus within OVR, but BVRS is the largest bureau. We have about 700 total employees, and we are running our offices uh, anywhere between 10 to 20% down right now. We're letting them go to 20% down, so those are some pretty significant vacancies in our offices, so we're struggling with some pretty escalating caseloads. Um, so just bear with us if you um, are trying to, to be in contact with somebody and, and there's some delays. We're trying our best to get to people. Um, we recognize that, that counselor positions, our early reach coordinators, our business service reps, our clerical staff, our fiscal, you know, everybody, our entire team, our management staff in every office is really integral to, to providing vocational rehabilitation services. And we certainly hope to, to be able to start filling positions in a more uh, steady manner um, after we get ourselves um, straightened out a little bit more. So, Shannon, would you like to add anything for the other bureaus? I mean, I think we're experiencing it across multiple systems in the different bureaus. We are uh, trying to be strategic in who we're bringing on. Um, those that are in most need, we're trying to fill those first. Um, we have to do a lot of things internally within OVR. So I came in at a, at a hop in time, of course, <laughs> to keep me busy, you know, but um, we have a good team. Uh, but we're, you know, we're low on staff, so we have to begin to address some of those issues um, internally, and some of that could be organizational restructure and things like that internally, so that we can improve our customer service and, and working with the community. Um, we've been, you know, uh, going through some of the financial things that we have as an agency. It's just been tough with all the change, you know, so I think a lot of people are just weary and tired uh, in doing that, but we we have to look at how we're doing things going forward so we can improve our service delivery model. Yep. All right, it is 435. I believe we're to end at 445.